Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of those, all of you who have so kindly accepted our invitation to participate in our webinar. We're fortunate today in having with us an extraordinarily distinguished panel to discuss the causes and consequences of Gulf state involvement in the Levant in North Africa. The region, that region is going through great turmoil today and the Gulf states for the first time in probably a thousand years are now intimately involved in that turmoil. Are they a part of the solution? Are they part of the problem? How will they extricate themselves from the region in the future? Or will they be a permanent part of the landscape? Our speaker, I won't run through the speakers, only to introduce our new moderator, Dr. Gaudet Bachgat, Professor of National Defense University and a non-resident senior fellow with us at the Gulf International Forum. Dr. Gaudet, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and it's a great honor to be with you. And I uh, uh, will be very brief uh, introducing the speakers, but to uh, set the stage, uh, there is a clear uh, power vacuum in the region. Uh, and it's very interesting time to study and follow the Middle East. The Middle East has never been boring, but it is even more exciting now. This power vacuum uh, is on three levels, domestic, regional, and international. On the domestic level, it is clear that uh, the model authoritarian regimes introduced has not succeeded. From the Arab Spring till today, uh, from Mubarak to Gaddafi to Assad, Syria, to Yemen, to Iraq, uh, this Arab nationalism first by President Nasser and now these uh, Arab regimes, uh, this authoritarian model has failed to meet people's expectations and the research for new model. On the regional level, uh, Egypt, Syria and Iraq used to be the main pillars of Middle Eastern system, Arab world system. The three countries now are much weaker than they used to be. Syria and Iraq are, uh, have been in war uh, one after another from 1980 for Iraq and now civil war in Syria. Egypt with a huge population, more than 100 million people, has uh, severe uh, economic challenges and because of this Egypt lost a lot of its leverage. On the international level also, uh, United States, Russia, China, and the European Union are uh, trying to uh, present themselves as the uh, global power. And uh, probably uh, the coronavirus, uh, the way United States and uh, Europe handled the coronavirus uh, was disaster. And just two days ago, uh, the Iranian foreign minister said in the parliament, there is a new shift of power in the world to the east. And uh, I'm not sure how credible, but I believe probably many people agree with this statement. But uh, United States still major power and there is a competition between between United States, Russia, and China in the Middle East. Uh, with all these uncertainties, regional powers, regional states are trying to secure their interest. The Gulf states uh, have a lot of uh, financial resources and uh, they are trying to transform these financial muscles into political power, political leverage. Money talks and when you have money, uh, you want to gain respect and influence. Uh, this is not only on uh, state level, but 
in the United States, like in many other countries, usually rich people try to run for public offices to gain political power. Uh, but uh, money by itself is not sufficient. Money, as they say in social science, is necessary but not sufficient. And because of this, Gulf states have been trying to build alliances with other regional powers, mainly Iran, Turkey, and Israel. Uh, Iran has been under heavy sanctions, mainly from the United States, but also uh, United Nations, European Union, and uh, Iran almost came back uh, with the nuclear deal, but with maximum pressure from Trump administration, uh, Iran still has some way to go to play its role as regional power. Israel, uh, some Gulf states are trying to normalize relations with Israel. And I believe Israel is regional power. Mm -hmm. Israel is here to stay. But normalizing relations between Gulf states, some Gulf states and Israel is the right thing for the wrong reason. The right thing because Israel is here to stay. Israel is regional power, but the one main driver for this normalization between some Gulf states and Israel is against Iran. Iran is another major regional power, and also Iran, the Islamic Republic, is here to stay. Uh, Gulf states should accept Israel not to uh, build another alliance against Iran or against any other regional power, but because Israel is regional power. Uh, finally, Turkey. Uh, Turkey, a uh, large country with a lot of resources, and uh, Turkey uh, has model, this model uh, mixes Islam and democracy. And for some people, the Turkish model is attractive. And uh, in the uh, United States in the last few years, some people question the Turkish model. But Turkey as regional power, some Gulf states are building alliance with uh, Turkey. And because of this, uh, we see the conflicts in Libya, in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq, and other places. Uh, where we go from here, uh, this, I believe, our uh, distinguished speakers will uh, share their experience with us. And I'm very glad to welcome the first speaker, former Turkish uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Yakis. Minister Yakis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, very high level uh, forum. Uh, the question that I was asked is actually uh, Turkey's, uh, Turkey's interest in Syria and Libya, or Levant and uh, Libya. Uh, and uh, what is the justification for Turkey's presence uh, in these uh, geographical areas. Uh, I believe that uh, the reason for Turkey's presence in Syria and in Libya stem from different things. They are not, they are not based on the same uh, criteria. In Syria, uh, it started with the, uh, with, by joining the international community in uh, 2011 when the Syrian authorities used disproportionate military power against the uh, civilian rioters, against the youth and the students. But it evolved in a different manner because at the beginning, Turkey was cooperating with the international community to help the civilians by providing uh, weapons that was coming from the international community through Turkey. 
Later on, the international community became aware that the weapons that they were providing to the rioters uh, was falling in the wrong hands. Then uh, the international community put on break, but Turkey was late or slow in putting on break. And uh, to use a uh, football terminology, Turkey was left on the offside position uh, with the uh, international community. And uh, later on, at, a, at another stage of this crisis, Turkey's, uh, first of all, position changed. It became, as the international community, international uh, media was referring to, Turkey became a highway for the uh, jihadists and the extremist fighters that were going to Syria. And uh, this was at the second stage. At the third stage, Turkey's main worry shifted from helping the uh, uh, the rioters or providing weapons to the extremists to something else. It was the Kurdish uh, Syrian Kurds that were organized under the name of the uh, Democratic Union Party of uh, Okay, I'm afraid we lost connection with uh, Minister Yakis. Uh, so we can switch to uh, Stephen Cook till we fix the connection with Minister Yakis. Got that? You'd like to proceed with me? Uh, please, uh, and okay. I introduce, introduce Stephen, he's a very yeah. prolific writer and with the Council on Foreign Relations, one of the top think tanks, not only in the United States, but around the world. And most important, uh, Stephen is a close friend and very nice guy. Oh, the thank you very much, right? yeah, that. It's, a, it's a pleasure. And I hope we get Minister Yakish back because uh, I was hoping to hear a bit more about uh, his perspective on, uh, on Syria and Libya. Um, in any event, uh, before I start, I just want to thank uh, the Gulf International Forum for the kind invitation. This is actually my first GIF event. Uh, is it GIF or GIF? I don't know. Um, special thanks to Patrick, Anas, and Dania um, for making this happen, and thanks to you, Gabet, and my co-panelists. Um, my task here today is to discuss the history of Turkish-Egyptian relations, how the Gulf states have affected relations between Ankara and Cairo in the last few years, the U.S. role in lowering tension in the Mediterranean, and I have a grand total of eight minutes to accomplish all of that. So let me apologize a little bit in advance for saying if I skim over things and I don't go to drill down too deep in, uh, in details, you'll, you'll pardon me. Um, this is a relationship, the relationship between Egypt and Turkey has long been complicated along a number of dimensions, even before the fall of Hosni Mubarak and the overthrow of Mohamed Morsi. Um, I see, uh, His Excellency Minister Yakish back. Um, no, I, I believe you can go ahead and finish your presentation. Okay. And we'll I'll go ahead back. and then we can return. Um, so I, 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 this is, as I was saying, is a, a complicated relationship. I won't go back too far in, in, in time, but I'll just give you a flavor of some of those uh, complications and problems. First, uh, in the mid-1990s, the Egyptians were unhappy with the development of Turkish-Israeli military and security ties and the U.S. effort to anchor security in the eastern Mediterranean with Turkish and Israeli power. Um, the then uh, Egyptian uh, foreign minister, Amr Musa, made very big deal about, uh, about this issue and did everything possible to undermine it. Um, this had to do with normalization, but it also had to do with these two very large powers at opposite ends of the Eastern Mediterranean and, and how they look at each other. The second uh, complication or problem between the two countries is that Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood, the kind of granddaddy of all the Islamist movements, didn't much like Turkish Islamists, didn't like the Mili Gurush uh, movement, uh, regarding the Turks as too nationalists and too liberal. 
Um, obviously, that changed over time, uh, particularly with the changes that happened in Egypt beginning in 2011. But nevertheless, the history of these two Islamist movements were quite different. And it bothers me when people call the Justice and Development Party a Muslim Brotherhood Party. It's clearly not. It has different origins and, and actually quite a different worldview. Um, then uh, moving on from that, the Egyptians resented with the rise of the Justice and Development Party in Turkey um, what they considered to be Turkey's meddling in the Palestinian issue, especially when it came to Gaza and Hamas. Um, they believe that Ahmed Davutoglu's kind of problem solving and then Prime Minister Erdogan's patronage of Hamas really did compromise uh, Egyptian security and uh, did not like uh, a Turkish presence in the Gaza Strip. That hasn't really changed much over time. Then, um, you know, there was sort of this, this idea of this golden age after Husky Mubarak's overthrow. Uh, and I was actually in Cairo during uh, Prime Minister Erdogan's uh, victory tour through North Africa after the Arab uprisings. And the, everybody focuses at the, uh, focused at the time on a statement that, that Prime Minister Erdogan made on Egyptian television about um, the importance of piety within an officially secular uh, system, which kind of rubbed uh, Egyptian Islamists the wrong way. But I think uh, on a broader level, one of the things that was quite complicating and, and, a, and a source of tension, even at this time of great kind of hope for a transition and Turkey being a model and taking the Egyptians under their wing and forging a new, more democratic and open uh, open Egypt was the fact that there was a sense among Egyptians, and I think across the board, that the Turks were a bit overbearing. Um, Erdogan arrived with this huge, uh, huge um, entourage, uh, lots of business people. It's not that the Egyptians were going to say, we don't want your investment, but there was a sense that there was this kind of uh, uh, overbearing sense. And, and I think it was a function of the fact that the Justice and Development Party had a stylized version of Ottoman history and didn't really recognize that there remain latent tensions uh, in, uh, in the relationship. But of course, the real problems came after the coup d'etat that overthrew Mohamed Morsi on July 3rd, 2013. Um, it should be clear to anybody uh, who is familiar with Turkish history why, and familiar with the Justice and Development Party, why uh, then Prime Minister Erdogan took such a hard line on uh, on the Egyptian coup. Uh, uh, you know, not only was it his investment in Morsi and investment in Egypt and a sense of solidarity with the Muslim Brotherhood, but there was this sense Erdogan is an extraordinarily shrewd politician and understands Turkey's recent history and uh, has um, and is paranoid actually in a good way about um, about uh, coups and moves of militaries uh, in society. And so as a result, um, was very, very outspoken uh, with regard to, uh, to the overthrow of Morsi. Um, then he also welcomed the Brotherhood to Turkey uh, and allowed them to engage in a campaign to try to undermine the new Egyptian leader, Abdul Tassisi. Um, in uh, and this really led to this kind of breakdown or this shakeout of axes in the region where you had the Saudis and the Emiratis in particular supporting Abu Tassisi and the Turks and the Qataris who were supporting uh, the ousted Muslim Brotherhoods and stood on the question of principle that Mohammed Morsi was allegedly elected freely and as a result needed to be, uh, needed to be supported in this ran counter to uh, and the coup d'etat ran counter to uh, to these principles. This it coincided with now, you know, uh, without making any real judgment on this, this was the view, a principled position coming from Ankara about the coup. Uh, and it also coincided with and led to, in ways, a collapse of Turkey's strategic position in the region. You had, after this episode, extraordinarily difficult relations between Ankara Riyadh, Abu Dhabi, Cairo, plus the Israelis and the Bahrainis, all of whom supported the Egyptian coup. And the Turks even uh, criticized the United States for basically accommodating itself to this, uh, this takeover. On the other side of it, you obviously had Turkey and Qatar 
uh, supporting the ousted Muslim Brotherhood. Um, whereas Turkey had um, a lot of soft power in the region beforehand, uh, it uh, significantly that significantly diminished over the summer of uh, of 2013. Not just because of its position with regard to the coup d'état in Egypt, but because of what was happening inside of Turkey, specifically the, the Gezi Park protest. But nevertheless, this prism of these two axes, Saudi, Emirati, Egyptian, plus Israel and the Bahrainis and the Turks and the Qataris, plus the Muslim Brotherhood or and or Islamists, however you want to define them, is the prism through which major regional issues have been viewed. And there is a destabilizing feedback loop deepening the divide between Egypt and Turkey. Egyptians are already suspicious of the Turks. And when the blockade of Qatar comes about and Turkey supports the Qataris and the Qataris support the Turks, and both have, in the perception of Egypt, worked to weaken the Egyptian regime, it adds to Egyptian neuralgia. Uh, the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the Egyptians all have common views of the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamists more generally all regard Turkey and Qatar as enablers and supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood, and worse, especially in Syria. Still, and so again, this feeds these neurologists, this feeds these neurologists, and you have the Egyptians regarding Turkey as a destabilizing force in the region, the Qataris as a destabilizing force in the region, and from the sidelines, you have the Emiratis and the Saudis and the Bahrainis and the Israelis saying, yes, they are destabilizing uh, destabilizing the region. And still, I want to pin this all on the machinations of the Gulf states. Uh, what the Gulf states, to my mind, are engaged in is basically personal beefs among their leaders that are really defy negotiated solution. There are real geostrategic issues that divide uh, that divide Turkey and Egypt. And I think that um, they both have taken steps in order to deepen those divides on their own, in which these other actors in the Gulf have enabled, accentuated, and deepened. And let's just let, let me just lay them out before I turn to uh, the United States. It's clear that the Egyptians can be unreasonably paranoid about the exercise of Turkish power or Qatari influence around the region. Um, you know, to speak with some Egyptians, you would find, a, you know, a, a Qatari under every couch and under every table working diligently to undermine, uh, to undermine Egypt. At the same time, you know, look, there have been things that have happened. Turkey has been needlessly provocative in the Red Sea, in Sudan, uh, in Libya, and in the Mediterranean. I don't need to remind anybody of the geography of this. This is Egypt's front yard, its backyard, and its side yard. Uh, and with the exercise of Turkish power in all of these places and the support that Turkey gets from the Qataris, the Emiratis and the Saudis don't have to do all that much to accentuate tension between these two very large countries. And to the point where now we're looking at Libya and the question of the last few weeks and the coming weeks is, will there be an actual conflict between Egypt and Turkey in Libya. Uh, I think you can make a stronger case that uh, Egypt has interests in Libya as opposed to uh, Turkey's interests in Libya, although that's not to suggest that they don't and they don't have reasons uh, to be forging a relationship uh, with Turkey. But once again, this is an issue of Egypt's backyard and something that it consists considers it to be uh, its uh, a prime security interest. Now, what should the United States do about all of this? You know, this is a much harder question than one might think, especially since, look, Egypt is a strategic ally of the United States. I don't even really know what that means any longer, but it's a strategic ally of the United States, even though it doesn't always act that way. Turkey is a NATO ally of the United States, even though it often doesn't act that way. And the Gulf states are critical partners. All of the Gulf states are critical partners to the United States. So under, under these circumstances, in the broad abstract, it would be easy for the United States to play referee uh, among these countries. The problem is, as I pointed out, one, for the Gulf states, from my perspective, the differences among them are really actually 
differences that rise to a personal level among leaders in the region that defy American effort to negotiate a, a, a solution to it. And, and Gulf officials have admitted as much that these are actually personal issues among them. Second, for Egypt in particular, these issues, when it comes to Libya, when it comes to its staff, when it comes to the Red Sea, when it comes to the Mediterranean, these are real high stakes existential security issues, when you, especially when you add on to it the neurology concerning the Muslim Brotherhood, Turkey's enabling of the Muslim Brotherhood, and Turkey's uh, enabling of actually extremist groups in Syria, which the Egyptians believe is easily translatable to the, to the Sinai Peninsula. So we're looking at these very high stakes conflicts in which the United States is supposedly going to referee. What makes this even more difficult on top of this high stakes thing is that the United States doesn't actually quite know what it wants in the region, whether it's North Africa, whether it's the Levant, whether it is the Gulf. Um, there's no clear strategy. Um, what does the United States want in the Eastern Mediterranean? I don't think there's anybody in Washington in a position of policy making authority who can answer that question for it. Um, and, and I don't think they can make that argument other than Iran when it comes to the Gulf. Um, the United, in, 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 so as long as the United States doesn't know what it wants, doesn't actually understand what's important to itself, when the primary discussion in Washington, D.C. is how best to leave the region, it makes it very, very hard for the United States, even though everybody can see these problems coming, for the United States to intervene in a way that prevents a potential conflict between Egypt and Turkey in a place like Libya. Um, I know what I would do, what I would say, but I'm not in that. I'm not in that position. And the Trump administration and the Obama administration before that all saw, both saw the Middle East as a place in which, and the Middle East writ large, as a place in which uh, American power is actually undermined because it's overextended. And I don't think that you're going to find strong American engagement on, for example, Libya at the level that it requires in order to keep these two countries from, uh, from coming to blows and with the Gulf states enabling them. If they don't come to blows, it's because of decisions that they themselves make rather than what the United States is doing. I'll stop there. I may have taken more time than the eight minutes, but uh, thank you very much. I look forward to the uh, discussion after the presentations. Cheers. Thank you, Stephen. And I'm not sure uh, Minister Yak is, is uh, still connected. Uh, I believe he was disconnected. Uh, so if this is the case, if he is not online with us, we will go next to Betal Akas. Uh, she is a PhD student uh, at the very prestigious university, Durham University in UK. And she uh, got part of her education at Qatar University. And uh, we are very delighted to have her with us on the panel today. Bitel, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Gavdak. My name is Betul. Uh, it's Arabic, so <laughs> it's easier for you, but I know spelling is not very clear. Um, thank you very much, Gulf International Forum, for inviting us and putting this all together. And it's a really important topic to talk about. Um, I mean, roughly my speech will be between eight to 10 minutes, just like Stephen's, so it won't be very long or like shorter than this. Um, I will start, like, I will talk about the Gulf's interest in uh, Libya, which makes it uh, contradicting with Turkey's interest in Libya. So at the initial point, we need to define, do we have a Gulf interest in Libya? What we mean by it? Um, we, we don't have a Gulf interest in Libya, and, and we don't have a GCC policy making or unified GCC voice for Libya as well. And this is the problem since the eruption of Arab Spring that we don't have any more for many issues in the regional conflicts. Uh, we don't have a unified GCC stance. And, um, 
regarding the Gulf in Libya, we can talk Saudis and Emiratis, and uh, Saudi Arabia is more like a subordinated ally for United Arab Emirates and its military intervention to Libya. So they do support and they do support financially Haftar's forces, but they are not at the ground like Emiratis to fight with uh, Haftar's forces. But when it comes to this course of uh, narrative of the leaders, uh, they support what, what they are doing in uh, in Libya against the uh, I mean United Nation uh, nation supported government. Then um, the question goes for why United uh, Arab Emirates is in Libya. What is the um, reason behind its motivation for being in a really uh, war uh, raged country? So th this is a problem itself, the question is a problem itself, because when we look at the national interests and priorities of United Arab Emirates, it is not actually very reasonable to be in a war, uh, and in a war coming from a long historical period, and now in a very high stake of conflict. Uh, so the, it's already being in Libya for a small oil monarchy who doesn't have a neighborhood uh, like who is not in the neighborhood stage, who has other priorities internally or regionally. But um, when it comes to ideologically um, driven priorities being a counter-revolutionary uh, flag in the Middle East. So as we all know, Imarat is supporting Statisco in the region and the ones are working hardly against the national uh, Libyan national uh, government, uh, unified government are the ones who are supporting the military regime and status quo. So ideologically, there's a reason for Imara to be in Libya. On the other side, it's it's really the underlining reason is the regime survival. Because when we look at the threats to the Gulf countries from the very beginning of the Arab Spring, the democratic Although it's not a spring anymore, but the idea of democracy is already in the minds of people and the leaders. We had many reforms in the region, uh, although not many of them are successful yet. So the regime's survival against any democratization or against any military regime in the in the Middle East, in the extended Middle East, uh, is a priority for, for United Arab Emirates national interests. So what makes them in Libya is also their concerns for regime survival in the extended Middle East not only in the GCC. The, the last reason for why we have uh, United Arab Emirates in Libya and conflict, it's basically more geopolitical reasons. United Arab Emirates, it's a financially powerful country in the GCC and the, ba the way they govern and manage their port politics, the way they are actually managing their policies in Yemen, in Adan, in Horn of Africa, they are extending their economic um, ties with having more ports and they are settling themselves as a port uh, power, not only in the Middle East, but in the extended, uh, extended region. So it's economically means something for UAE to be in the Libya. So how they make it, how they ended up with being in a military force in Libya, it's actually more uh, just like uh, one of the other speakers said before me, there was a power vacuum in the in the entire region because we don't have any more power centers like Iraq, Egypt, uh, and Syria. They are not powerful enough as they were before. So this power vacuum has encouraged small monarchies and small powers to have this maneuver space for their political political um, tools. So the young leaders, both MBS and MBs, that they had this chance and the assertive role they have in the foreign policy making and the militarization of their foreign policy, especially regarding the UAE, helped them to see the chances over the crisis. So the chances for UAE in the crisis in Libya to show their military power and their uh, their ability to connect networks and um, and different power uh, centers of the country, and they are quite successful regarding their role militarily. Uh, I mean, you cannot define success if you kill humanitarian uh, assets, but I mean, like the way they. Um, they are using the military equipments and the intelligentsia, their network of alliances with the military groups are quite successful for a small country on the region. So this is a separatist and expansionist, if you like to define it in Libya, 
the way they approach their policy making, but it also helps to show their kind of new role or assertive role in the region. So um, when it comes to Turkey, what makes Turkey, I mean, what are the Turkey's motivation? I am sure um, uh, the ambassador, uh, Yakiz, is going to talk more about it, but I would like to like shortly mention about Turkey's um, initial aims for Mediterranean is political economic uh, motivations. They need oil and gas economically, and they have a share in maritime zone in the Mediterranean, but they have problems with the other parties who has also sh- who have also shares, and diplomatically they are quite isolated regarding their share in the Mediterranean. So what makes Libya really closer to their interest, the Libya's share in the Mediterranean. So the agreement started with a political economic aspect, then it moved to a military Tension, military, uh, military orientation. So um, Turkey has four main roles in Libya. The the one is uh, diplomatic. Um, it has a really um, highly challenged diplomatic role between France, Italy, Russia, uh, United Nations, and European Union. Since Turkey doesn't have very good relations with Emirates and Mesir now at the moment with the Egypt. Um, they have problems, uh, I mean, Turkish politicians have problems connecting with two sides of the conflict, but at least they are connecting Russia with the uh, Libyan government. So diplomatic shuttle is the first, then humanitarian purposes, because um, when, uh, especially the Wagner group and Russian mercenaries, when they leave the cities, they left landmines behind, and Turkish and Italian uh, armies and officials, they are part of this demining humanitarian aid, aid to Libya. And the third one is actually all over this uh, dimensions. Turkey militarily engaged since March operation by Libyan government. They are heavily part of the uh, government uh, military operation. They do help with the training according to agreement. They, they, they have their own troops. They have mercenaries from Syria, which is not uh, publicly validified by the government sources, but we can see them from the other agencies, reports, humanitarian agencies, etc. And they have with their military equipments and um, and intelligence sharing as well. So the last part, what makes Turkey in Libya is post-crisis atmosphere. Since Turkey's uh, investment companies and construction companies were already in Libya before the Arab Spring, but since we have all the conflict in Libya, we, Turkish uh, companies don't do any business uh, in Libya anymore. But after the crisis, according to current agreements with the Libyan government, Turkey can again settle economically in Libya in the post-crisis atmosphere, which can bring a lot of economic gain uh, to economically struggling country like Turkey. So what makes UAE's role in, um, in Libya pl- problematic over all these discussions? Since we have a embargo, arms embargo by United Nations on Libya, UAE is supporting Haftars, which are not legitimately there. It makes um, a difficult, uh, I mean, defending themselves and their purposes in Libya for a country like like United Arab Emirates, who cares a lot regarding the international prestige and branding, and they do work very hard so far since Sheikh Zayed to improve their international role and prestige. So being against United Nations arms embargo is something very negative. And the other one is bringing the question of redefining the UAE's role in the region, because it was since the very beginning of nation state, they were in the regional role, have, I mean, actively time to time, but the way they were settling themselves is more like foreign aid, mediation, active uh, infrastructural support, and a little bit like peaceful uh, military interventions. But since the 2014 uh, and 2015, the way they settled themselves in Yemen, in Libya, brings the question to the minds if they are becoming a power more militarized and assertive and um, is it not anymore a soft power but rather um, uh, I mean as we as we said for the previous discussion is it a destabilizing force in the region so this is a big question uh, for a country like UAE who has multi-dimensional foreign policy goals and the other problem is human rights violations in Libya 
there are many reports by Human Rights Watch and United Nations referring to the hospital bombings and mass graves after um, Haftar's leaving the cities and le lifting it for civilians. So all these mercenaries issues uh, which are coming from Sudan, Chad and Eritrea on behalf of Emirati army brings also another question to the mind. Is it a dirty hand war or is it a clear transparent military intervention? So we have all these problems plus Al Maktoum's uh, disagreement with the military intervention to Libya, which they publicly already uh, expressed it. So my conclusion points are the problem regarding UAE's role in Libya and what makes it uh, contradictory with Turkey's interest is not going to something um, will, will be uh, overcome in a short period of time. Both lines and both, both parties are really insisting in their motivations and interests. So I think we will have more problematic cases, unfortunately, in the region, in the extended Middle East between UAE and Turkey. And Libya is just one example of it. And we need uh, as if I mean, it is, is in the previous times of Arab politics, we need more um, moderate and leadership role by Saudi Arabia to moderate uh, UAE's role in the region, which is obviously now more assertive and militarized, uh, maybe more than necessary for a small power who has actually a small state to improve their social and political interests rather than intervening the other countries. So this is all. Thank you very much, and I believe now we have Minister Yakis with us back. Uh, Minister Yakis, are you uh, able to reconnect? Okay. Okay. Uh, Steve, uh, Stephen Cook uh, gave us uh, the uh, implication for the United States, and uh, to to great extent, United States considers uh, Libya. Europe's backyard, and uh, probably this is why under both Obama administration and Trump administration, uh, United States has been uh, hesitant to uh, uh, take the lead in Libya uh, and leave it to Europe. The European perspective, we are very fortunate to have Quentin with us. He will give us the European perspective and he is uh, international advisor for research institute for Europeans and American studies. And as I said, he's based in Greece. Uh, Quentin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I believe uh, uh, Ambassador Yakis is actually connected, but uh, the, the, the microphone is just cut. So, so uh, I don't know if um, if I should proceed now or let. No, give the floor. I, I'm back on the microphone as well. Okay, okay, Minister, uh, please go ahead. And uh, you started uh, your excellent presentation. I would love to hear more from you. Thank you. First, uh, I don't want to cut uh, the word of my Greek friend, but if uh, you want me to complete what I started to talk about Syria, one uh, important thing uh, for Turkey's involvement in Syria was actually a more sectarian approach of Turkey to the Syrian question. Because, as you may know, uh, the ruling party in Turkey, Justice and Development Party, AKP party, its, its ancestors were uh, inspired from the Muslim Brotherhood traditions and the ideology. And when the Arab Spring broke out in, uh, in uh, Tunisia, then it spread to Egypt, then Libya, then Syria. The AKP people, ideologists of the AKP people, thought that now it's a golden opportunity for Turkey because Muslim Brotherhood, like-minded political parties, are about to come to power all the way from Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, and Syria. And Turkey is a country which has a slightly better experience in multi-party democracy could lead this, uh, these countries, this belt of the, uh, of this belt of countries which will be governed 
by the Muslim Brotherhood like-minded political parties. So the underlying reason in Turkey's close interest in what's happening in uh, in Syria was this, because Turkey uh, took into consideration that the big majority of the Syrian people are Sunni, and also Muslim Brotherhood uh, ideology was very strong. So he wanted to it wanted to capitalize on it. This is as far as Turkey's interest in Syria is concerned. Now, turning to Libya, in Libya, uh, the, the reasons are slightly different because uh, it, it started with Turkey's uh, asserting itself in, the, uh, in what it considers its own maritime jurisdiction area in the Eastern Mediterranean. As you may know, Turkey has the longest coastal line in the Eastern Mediterranean. Despite this fact, because of the definition of the uh, uh, convention of the uh, law of the sea, uh, Turkey's maritime jurisdiction area became very limited, especially because of the fact that Turkey could not cooperate, it has various problems with all countries in the Eastern Mediterranean, including Israel, Syria, Cyprus, Greece, and Egypt. With Egypt, the maritime jurisdiction area was not that important, but with the others, there were problems. So Turkey wanted to use its own criteria to delineate or to delimit the uh, its own maritime jurisdiction area. And it found out that there is a convergence of uh, limits between the, uh, somewhere in the east of Crete Island of Greece, th there is an area where Turkish uh, economic zone or uh, maritime uh, jurisdiction area uh, touches the Libyan one, and Turkey wanted to jump upon this in order to uh, to assert itself in the in the Eastern Mediterranean, and this opportunity coincided with the. Libyan needs or Tripoli government need, the government of the national accords need, dire need actually, to find a strong ally in order to prevail over the Haftar forces. So uh, because of this, Turkey signed a, a delimitation agreement for the uh, maritime economic zone with Libya, and also and military uh, assistance, military uh, cooperation agreement with Libya. These two reasons uh, played into the hand of Turkey, and Turkey wanted to use this opportunity. But once in Libya, of course, there were several problems because Turkey was already cooperating uh, in Syria with Russia, but in in Syria, Turkey has problems at the same time with Russia because Turkey's aims in Syria are not the same with Russia, and its its aims are not the same with the United States, and they're not exactly the same with uh, Iran. So Turkey was a little isolated uh, in Syria. In Libya. It became the same again. Turkey and Russia found themselves in opposing ranks because uh, Wagner forces were already present there and they are still there. And the Turkey now, uh, Turkey, Turkey supported uh, uh, military forces fight now against another force, which is Haftar's force. Which is supported by uh, by uh, Russia, but also by Egypt for good reasons because it's a neighboring country. 
United Arab Emirates, France, and to a lesser degree, perhaps, uh, by, the, by Saudi Arabia. So Turkey now has opened or, or spread its forces a little too much. And now, of course, there is also the question of uh, Yemen, which adds further difficulties or further complications. Whether Turkey will be able to overcome all these difficulties, it, is, it remains to be seen. So this is where we are at present. Thank you, thank you, Minister, and that's uh, it's a very interesting perspective, and uh, we will have many questions uh, later on. But first, we will hear from our colleague from Greece, Quentin. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm French to answer uh, Minister Yakis thing, and, and based in Paris. Um, but it's the same, it's uh, the European Union, right? Um, thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. I'm very honored. Um, I've been asked to um, talk about the Gulf State Fall uh, in the confrontation over energy in the Mediterranean and uh, how the Gulf states uh, are affecting the interests of the different uh, uh, EU countries, um, um, particularly Greece, uh, Italy, Italy, and France. Um, I, I would like to start by, by saying that all not is energy related in the in in the uh, uh, tensions in the Mediterranean. If you if you talk to all business executives, they, they they often tell you. Um, I mean, private uh, companies. Um, they often tell you that uh, they have difficulties in uh, uh, finding the, the the funds to develop certain uh, uh, oil and gas field uh, due to funders willingness to design engage from a, a carbon related energies so so there are other aspects because they know that probably some uh, oil fields won't be uh, developed probably not in the in the in the in, in the coming years and there are other other aspects that are obviously what we uh, the other panelists talked about uh, the economic zones the, the influence uh, historical links and of course the refugee crisis um, and 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 the and the different market um, what we have seen uh, for the past years uh, is a more um, assertive foreign policy of several Gulf states uh, that mutated from uh, uh, financing uh, groups or party or state actors into expanding militarily and economically from uh, uh, the red sea infrastructure to the Mediterranean space involvement. Uh, that trend is uh, blatant in the case of uh, the UAE, but it also indicates a willingness of uh, a projection uh, abroad, I would say. Uh, to the real European countries, I would say that it's a new reality that they have to deal with. Um, um, the, the, in the past, the main interaction between uh, the, the European uh, uh, um, countries and the, GCC, uh, and the GCC countries were more related to the Gulf security and, of course, the uh, preservation of the almost uh, uh, the, the, the collaboration was in effect to, to protect this road that is strategic to all and directly uh, in the immediate interest of the GCC country. Now, I would argue that uh, uh, th there is a shift um, uh, in which we see GCC countries getting involved uh, in uh, 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 an area that is of particularly close and immediate interest to uh, some uh, European countries, uh, and most notably, of course, Italy, Greece, uh, and France. Uh, for long, uh, the EU countries uh, uh, have seen the GCC as more or less tech clients, but also we've seen lately uh, a change in the relationship with the GCC country because uh, 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 it's uh, research uh, Sixia Bianco who said it uh, very aptly. She, she said that uh, the GCC sees the uh, EU as a weak security partner now. Uh, they more wish to to focus on the development of uh, a business ties and uh, penetrate the EU market thanks to a free trade agreement. Uh, but one common characteristic that the uh, GCC and the EU uh, share as of today, I would say, is their lack of ability to coordinate a foreign policy, uh, for, forcing both uh, to act in a smaller unit composed of uh, several members of their respective unions. 
the competing goals uh, among these uh, countries uh, push them to favor bilateral engagement rather than uh, the usual multilateral platforms. Uh, for example, the, the, the France and the UAE uh, find obviously uh, a significantly aligned on the Mediterranean issue uh, regarding uh, uh, Libya, Egypt. Uh, uh, as to uh, France and Saudi Arabia, we know that, or well, it is said, uh, that the, the, the relationship between President Macron and Prime Prince uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman is not very warm, but uh, French are still very involved in the uh, in, uh, in development program in the uh, in, uh, in the kingdom, uh, most notably Alula or the Riyadh Metro, and now you see uh, uh, Saudi having uh, uh, being aligned with the, the UAE and France regarding uh, Libya, of course. In the, the case of Italy, uh, uh, the country wisely developed ties uh, with Qatar, uh, uh, notably in arms deal, uh, and to the great discontent of the French part, actually, uh, thinking about shipbuilder uh, Ficanteri, who managed to uh, have uh, gained some contract, uh, and uh, also investment on the uh, uh, island of uh, Sardinia. Um, and with the uh, and and with uh, Saudi Arabia, Italy also has uh, uh, strong uh, uh, ties. Uh, notably, uh, the same CEO of this uh, uh, shipbuilder, Fikantieri, uh, has been named a board member of uh, the Saudi Arabian Military uh, Industry Summit in 2018. So, the, the, what I wanted to to say is that the the, the, the bilateral. Uh, um, uh, uh, relations between uh, the country are, are more uh, uh, based on the short-term convergence of interest. The tension uh, with Turkey uh, in the Mediterranean space uh, aren't new, of course. Uh, Greece uh, and Turkey uh, often uh, uh, vocally collided uh, uh, over various uh, sovereignty issues, migration crisis, and oil drilling project, obviously. Uh, but uh, in the past, uh, Greece uh, did not find, uh, I would say, a, a concrete on-field support by EU members, and that, that could be a, that is uh, obviously can be explained by the fact that uh, uh, Turkey is a member of the Council of Europe. It has strong ties with the EU. It's an important member of the NATO alliance. Um, but the dynamic changed, uh, I would say, in the past years with uh, the GCC crisis and the uh, alignment of uh, Ankara and Doha uh, that rose tensions with the UAE and, and uh, Saudi Arabia. In response, for example, we saw a sudden and very visible uh, uh, ties between Saudi and Cyprus and Greece uh, with very high level uh, visits. Uh, for example, the first visit of the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Cyprus. It, it, it was uh, Ibrahim al Assad uh, back then. It, it was a first. It was followed by several uh, high profile by uh, Cyprus and Greek uh, uh, foreign minister who met directly with King Salman uh, from December, uh, from last December to February. It, it has to be noted that in this, at the same time, uh, a French foreign uh, uh, minister, Le Drian, uh, was uh, more or less uh, at the same time was in uh, Saudi Arabia, and he didn't get to meet uh, uh, nor n n neither uh, uh, Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman nor the king. He, he met with the uh, uh, ministers uh, with the nest of uh, foreign affairs back then. Um, so it, these uh, close ties between KS and, and uh, I mean, visibly close ties between KS and Turkey and Greece. Uh, marked a blatant appearance of a leading GCC country in the Mediterranean space. Um, obviously, from the French uh, perspective, uh, the Turkish uh, intervention in Libya uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Syria uh, supporting opposite side uh, as the one supported by the EU members led France to get more involved and siding with Greece. Um, uh, Italy, uh, on its sense, uh, obviously was a, uh, uh, consider, um, consideration because it, it considered that, uh, the rise of, uh, uh, Sid Marichal Arthur, uh, uh, 
uh, as, a, as a direct threat to its interest and it wishes to uh, hold stability in Tripoli. Uh, and therefore, naturally, for, for Italy, it was uh, making sense to uh, uh, keep close contact with Qatar and, Turka and Turkey on the, on the Libyan uh, issue. And all that shows that uh, the bilateral, bilateral uh, relations uh, were motivated, motivated by direct Sudan and temporary interest far away from the multilateral platform that uh, revealed ineffective uh, in bringing the stakeholders around the same table. For the UA, the Mediterranean uh, uh, area represents a key uh, area uh, uh, as well as a, a logical, uh, uh, I would say, space of projection. So any threat to the Mediterranean area is considered an existential threat uh, for uh, France, uh, Italy, and, and Greece, and obviously Cyprus too. Uh, therefore, there would, those three countries, uh, and particularly France and Greece, will welcome any involvement coming from countries that will, in fact, never be able to sustain a long-term presence and at the, could, at the same time could oppose Turkey. Uh, the, the, for, for France and, and Turkey, the emergence of, of uh, Kaysa, KSA, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and the United uh, Arab Emirates in the area is, 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 is uh, perceived as a relief for the time being. Um, but it, it has to be uh, noted that uh, behind uh, the strong uh, uh, vocal uh, stance, very political and vocal stance, there are actual uh, on-field realities. Uh, UAE remains the EU uh, state. Uh, an ally to both Greece and, uh, and France. And so, uh, despite the uh, signing of the exclusive economic zone uh, between Turkey and the GNA, Italy signed one with Greece on the 9th of June uh, that directly challenged the one signed by Turkey and the GNA. Um, on the other side, you have uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia that are in the public discourse at odd uh, but in reality, they still have significant business relationship. Uh, there was a paper list yesterday uh, published at the Gulf International Forum, actually, uh, by uh, Alessandro uh, uh, Bruno, and he puts it like he, he puts it like it: that Saudi exports to Turkey have not changed significantly in the past three years. Direct investment also stayed unchanged. Uh, and I would like to add that uh, during the COVID uh, crisis, uh, uh, Turkey and uh, 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 Saudi Arabia signed a uh, 200 million worth deal uh, for the construction of tur Turkish fiscal drones in KSA. And, 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 uh, and the Turkish drone Karayel are, are actually active in Yemen. And finally, for France, uh, I would say that uh, out of the uh, five biggest uh, clients of uh, uh, French weapons uh, for our uh, Arab states, Qatar, UAE, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. But Qatar, uh, UAE accepted all the uh, weapons contracts uh, to these countries have sharply decreased for the past years and profiting, uh, among others, to uh, Italy, Germany, uh, or South, uh, South Korea. So well, the... the the GCC uh, involvement in the Mediterranean space is mainly driven by, and it was said earlier, uh, by opportunistic motives. Uh, therefore, uh, I, I would argue that uh, despite this, these countries investing, we might accidentally, as they appeared, uh, see them uh, disengage. Um, and in times of uh, financial scarcity, uh, the Mediterranean space is not a direct priority for the GCC. Uh, and there is another big question uh, that uh, I, I, I don't think we mentioned is the, the, the racial involvement uh, that wishes to, to settle another base in the Mediterranean and selling the uh, S-400 uh, uh, missile system uh, to Algeria, Damascus, Libya, Egypt. Uh, that is something that actually the NATO member, the EU and the GCC will never or cannot really accept. Um, uh, so what we've seen uh, in the Mediterranean lake is more a shaping of new opportunistic bilateral partnership uh, based on mutual and short-term interest uh, between the GCC state and the EU state. Uh, the EU powers 
saw in good light the emergence of some GCC actors in the Mediterranean uh, space. Uh, uh, however, uh, will the GCC presence in the Mediterranean be long last lasting? Uh, I, I would argue uh, otherwise. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. This is a very good conclusion. And we have about 10 minutes for questions. I uh, have three questions and uh, we'll let anybody on the panel uh, address uh, any of them or all of them. One question about uh, Turkey. Uh, is Turkey overplaying its hands? Uh, Turkey is a huge country with many resources and the second largest military in NATO after United States. But Turkish economy is not doing very well. And uh, Turkey is involved in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, in Horn of Africa. Uh, is there concern that uh, there is too much on Turkey's plate? This is one question. Another question about Gulf states uh, with uh, very weak oil prices, very cheap oil prices. Uh, is there uh, prospects that with uh, low financial resources, Gulf states might uh, decide to end their very ambitious foreign policy. We saw uh, United Arab Emirates trying to withdraw from Yemen. Uh, is there, again, oil prices are not expected to go uh, much higher than uh, they were. Uh, and every country uh, decides its foreign policy based on its resources. So question was, uh, low financial resources, uh, will it impact uh, Gulf states' ambitious foreign policy? And lastly, uh, question about uh, is there potential that Greece and Turkey might come to agreement on uh, energy resources in East Mediterranean, including in Libya? Uh, Turkey and Greece uh, have long history, and in this long history, occasionally they agreed with each other, and occasionally they disagreed. Okay, uh, anybody in the panel would like to address some of these questions? And then we will take another wave of questions, another round of questions. I, I, I uh, guess I'll, I'll jump in here. There's, there's two that you asked you that that are particularly interesting to me. The first is whether Turkey is overplaying its hand in, in Libya. And I, I think the, the, the underlying logic of your question is, can Turkey afford to continue to undertake military operations in Syria, Iraq, as well as Libya, and Libya being, you know, 1,400 miles away from, from Turkey? Um, I'm old enough to remember... Uh, how many times the collapse of the Turkish economy has been predicted who allegedly know and that this was going to result in a fundamental way in which Turkey looked at the world and the way in which it pursued its foreign policy. That has never happened. I, I think the real problem for Turkey in Libya is the following, that it doesn't have the same kind of compelling geostrategic interests uh, that, for example, other actors do, specifically Egypt. Um, and that even if the Egyptians are only bluffing in what they do, they do have the means to make Turkey's life miserable in, uh, in, in Libya. I don't think that either of them are going to stand back from this uh, conflict, which means that the Turks are likely to be there, even with you know, thousands of Syrian uh, militiamen as their allies. I think that there's a strong possibility that the Turks are going to be in it for the long term. And I'm not sure why anybody would want to have Libya as a ward of their state, given the situation in Libya, given the fragmentary pressures on the country, given the extremism. Uh, in, in the country. Of course, there's large amounts of oil and gas there, but um, it, it does have the possibility to, to drain on Turkey. Uh, the, Turkey doesn't really have a, a grand strategy uh, for the Mediterranean. It is reactive, uh, it's vengeful, and it's romantic. Um, one can understand why the Turks are involved in the Aegean, why they're involved in and around Cyprus, why they're in Syria, why they're in Iraq. It's a much harder case to make uh, when it comes to Libya, which is far away from home. If it's all about checking the power of the UAE and Egypt, 
um, it strikes me that that's not a necessarily a winning strategy. But they could they have the capacity to stay for a long period of time. Then on this question, your second question with regard to the Gulf states and their ambitious foreign policies. I think that the Emiratis uh, sought to withdraw from Yemen, but not because uh, this happened long before the very significant slide in global oil prices. Uh, it happened in the middle of a kind of longer reduction in global oil prices, but not the most recent uh, slide in global oil prices. And I think the thinking in the Emirates was more that this was uh, a losing situation. Uh, they went into Yemen, they followed the Saudis into Yemen primarily because they thought the Saudis would lose in Yemen and they didn't want them to lose in Yemen. Now, after four and a half years, five years, uh, I think that they've recognized that it's a problem and seeking a, a way out. When it comes to Saudi Arabia and Yemen, they're trying to get out, uh, and yet the Houthis have them exactly where they want them. Um, I think there is oh, a, a, a desire to realign. I think the Saudis do recognize that there's a desire to realign. And I think the Emiratis think that too, but I think it's really a function of the fact that after the Iranians attacked uh, Abke and Khores in September 2019, and the United States said, hey, we're waiting for a phone call from Riyadh to decide what to do, that is really a motivating factor for uh, the Emiratis and the Saudis to trim their sails in certain ways. But as you point out, they remain active in a variety of other places, particularly the United Arab Emirates, which has a very particular worldview that does see the Mediterranean as its front door, that Egypt is a strategic asset, that checking the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamists is extraordinarily uh, important to them. Um, so uh, it, there's, there's some rationalizing of resources, but I don't think that there's a, there's a wholesale change coming. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, anybody else would like to comment on any of uh, the questions? Uh, Quentin, would you like to say something about uh, Greece and Turkey coming to an agreement? Well, uh, as the question says, they, 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 they've done that uh, before, so, so, so nothing uh, could be out of the question. Now, uh, the, the, the issue is that uh, Turkey sees that uh, its uh, economic zone, uh, that it has been very disadvantaged uh, uh, in the share of uh, the economic zone in the Mediterranean. And the uh, Greek uh, do not uh, want to uh, give up uh, on that, and that's why they signed uh, uh, with Italy. Um, Greek, from, I, I would say that the, the, the Greek are um, seizing the opportunity that uh, to confront, uh, I mean, at least vocally and diplomatically okay. with Turkey now that they have uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and um, uh, 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 partners that are more willing to do so, namely France, obviously. Uh, are they going to uh, uh, be able to, to sign a, a, a deal? Frankly, uh, uh, it's a hard question uh, that I would not be able to uh, to answer like that. Okay. Maybe. Thank you, uh, and uh, Minister, Minister uh, Yakis or Doctor. Yes, I will call you a doctor. Uh, yes. Would you like to say something about uh, Turkey overplaying its hands? Uh, can Turkey afford to uh, be a very active player in several regional conflicts? Is it my turn or? No? Uh, please go ahead, uh, Minister. Uh, actually, Turkey is overstretched at present because it has uh, tremendous economic difficulties. And the support for the main uh, ruling party is going down. Uh, but when it goes down, it doesn't mean that it will. Uh, it is going still to become the the biggest party in Turkey. Whether it could make coalitions with others and stay in power again, we do not know. But uh, one thing is certain: that Turkey has gone beyond its its means both in Syria and now in uh, Libya and in the Eastern Mediterranean and now perhaps in, in Yemen. I don't think that it, it is easy for, for, for the Turkish government to uh, take care 
of all these uh, complicated things and uh, and uh, come out of this uh, in a successful manner. That will be difficult. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Akes. A uh, couple of questions for you. Uh, one from the audience about uh, the role of Qatar in Libya. And the other question is a few months ago, it was reported that Mohammed bin Zayed uh, gave phone call to President Assad and uh, promised financial aid. Some people uh, speculated that uh, Mohammed bin Zayed was trying to distract Turkey, supporting Assad to fight Turkey in Syria. This way, Turkey will be weaker in Libya. Uh, do, do you agree with this uh, line of argument? Um, I can I can start with the first question, um, Qatar's role in Libya. Qatar's role in Libya actually started in 2011, uh, right after Gaddafi's um, death, and they were part of NATO's uh, military operation, along with United Arab Emirates. But the way they were in the operation was quite in a like in the purpose of peace, so they were not in the ground as much as the ones we have now in Libya. So it was a short military operation, but it means a lot to Qatar's air forces. So, but for now, we know that from the narrative of Emir Tamim and the foreign minister, um, he was even actually United Nations talks yesterday on Libya commission. Uh, they support the solution, which is more diplomacy oriented, but the way they support it from the Turkish approach, and they I don't know if they support Turkey financially, but they support Turkey politically. And, but they, they are not in the Libya militarily at the moment. Um, for the second question, um, I don't know if, uh, if Mohammed bin uh, Zaid, he has any intention uh, for eliminating Turkish forces in Syria, but I wasn't surprised if he had. But we know from Libya that many of the air forces, maybe even half of the air forces coming from uh, United Arab Emirates to Libya, they come over uh, Latkia, over Syria. So there are many uh, accounts in the internet, they indicate this air uh, traffic and they um, they uh, record Emirati airplanes. Some of them are belong to M M Air Force, but we, I mean, mostly they are civilian air uh, forces, I mean, airplanes. They come over Syria to Libya. So we see a Russian, Egyptian, Emirati, um, I mean, cooperation, but we can see somehow Syria also involved in this air trafficking. So um, I wasn't surprised because now they use Syria as a location to settle their forces in Libya. So why not they could help them to, because Turkey is really involved uh, in Syria. And regarding the previous question, which uh, Ambassador Yakush uh, answered, uh, I agree with him with the regard that there are problems, economic problems in Turkey. And if Libya conflict goes further for more years, I don't think Turkey can handle it because they need the investments in the post-crisis era. But if this crisis goes for a really long period, as we had in Syria, because here, I mean, in Turkey domestically, there are economic problems, so they won't be able to afford if they don't get any aid from any international organization or Qatar regarding their role in Libya, they won't be able to uh, play their assertive role in Libya. That's, that's my uh, reading it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because we are out of time, we will go uh, just less than one minute each speaker for final thoughts. Stephen, would you like to start just final thoughts in 30, 45 minutes, uh, seconds? When, when I am on the line, because I am interrupted very frequently, shall I start with my one please, minute? Please, Minister. Uh, actually, uh, Turkey's problem with uh, in, in Libya, uh, when you compare what Turkey is using as a pretext uh, in Syria, saying that uh, t Turkey's uh, security is threatened by uh, 
Kurds in Syria. Same reasoning could be used by Egypt, saying that if the Muslim Brotherhood dominated the uh, government of national uh, accord prevails in Libya, then it will perceive a threat from Libya to Egypt. So uh, Turkey has to, comp to, to weigh these pieces properly when it says that it, it perceives a threat from Syria because of Kurds. Egypt also is entitled to perceive threats from Libya, especially if the uh, Muslim Brotherhood dominated government of national accord prevails there. So this is something that I, I wanted to add. Thank you, Manasar. Uh, Stephen? So thank you so much. Uh, just to say, once again, thank you to Gulf International uh, Forum and to say that I think that these conflicts um, in which the Gulf states are involved, whether they're Libya or, or elsewhere, are, to my mind, likely to continue. Um, I think that none of the Gulf states are interested in doing the things that they would need to do either to tip the scales against one or the other of their actors uh, in order to uh, fundamentally change the situation. And as I said in my opening remarks, I see that the uh, conflicts uh, for, uh, e for Egypt is an ex er, the stakes are extraordinarily high. And that for the Gulf states, uh, these are uh, conflicts that are um, not necessarily, they may also be, but not necessarily rooted in geopolitics, which makes it very, very hard to imagine uh, them stepping back from uh, the two axes that they, they, they have uh, right now. I'll end there. And once again, thank you so much for uh, including me. Thank you, Dr. Akas. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gauda. Um, my final I mean, the closing remarks can be more on the stabilizing forces in Middle East. So, I mean, if we have more destabilizing forces bringing more United Arab Emirates intervention or Turkish intervention or any other discursive or uh, operational destabilizing action in the region, in the extended Middle East, the problems will be uh, will be triggered more. So. I think um, I think the way Turkey tried to handle in Libya, it's between diplomatic solution and military solution. But Turkish in Turkey's intervention helped uh, for diplomatic solution because they brought a balance to the military gap between Haftar and uh, the Libyan government. So um, I guess uh, there will be more European support on diplomatic solutions so Turkey can bring more Russians to the table and more Europeans so it can maybe uh, ease to conflict and we can reach a solution. Why not? Uh, hopefully it will be a peaceful resolution for Libyan people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kontin? Yes. Um, well, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for, for, for having us. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to close on the, on the fact that um, the, the U.S. perceived disengagement, uh, whether it's uh, uh, military from the Gulf or, or, or as uh, uh, a chaperone to the world peace, has uh, as worried many actors. Uh, and and uh, we've seen that uh, the stakeholders uh, all uh, try to develop some uh, bilateral uh, uh, ties. And I think it's... Uh, it, we, the, the multilateral platform should actually play their role back and, and step up a little bit to have everybody around the same table. I'm thinking about the NATO, obviously, the, the, the EU, the UN, uh, that uh, we've seen uh, uh, as uh, lately perceived as uh, weaker uh, uh, actors. Okay, uh, I would like to thank the four speakers. We had excellent presentations. Would like to thank all the participants from around the world. Also, would like to thank the Gulf International Forum for organizing this. And it's great to hear different perspectives. And thank you all.